Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here this day. Sorry, flashback. <clears throat> well, my name is John Gons. Well, it's actually worse than that. It's John Wisdom Gons the Third, and uh, I'm the co-author of the book, The Necronomicon Files: The Truth Behind the Legend. I'm also writing. Uh, together with my esteemed colleague, Daniel Harms. I can't forget about him. Um, I'm also writing a forthcoming book under the working title, Cult Busters, The Metaphysical Aspects of Mind Control. And we'll see how that turns out, assuming I can actually find time to write it and pay the electric bill. But it's really nice to see everybody here. Welcome to our presentation, Hacking the Human Brain, Aspects of Modern, I should say Postmodern, um, Mind Control. Uh, mind Control really has gotten, has, has, has uh, accumulated a lot of romance around it. It's, it's, it's become really, really popular in the movies. Uh, going way back to the old Alfred Hitchcock thriller Spellbound and then on to the Manchurian Candidate and A Clockwork Orange and, oh, shoot, man, Conspiracy Theory with Mel Gibson. Wow. Yeah. Uh, mind control has been so Hollywooded, in fact, that it's, it, it's, it's kind of iffy for some of us as to whether mind control is a legitimate issue anymore or maybe it's just some... Uh, conspiracy theory fantasy to some kind of an urban legend that we don't really have to worry about. In fact, that's one of the favorite disinformation tactics of the pro-cult, pro-mind control uh, propagandists or uh, apologists. Uh, there ain't no such thing as mind control. It's just a conspiracy theory fantasy. Why? Health care and mental health professionals don't even recognize it. <clears throat> well, try again. Uh, that's what we down here in the South refer to as a lie. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> try this on for size. Uh, the DSM-5, <clears throat> the Diagnostic Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, recognizes mind control and defines it as a dissociative disorder. Uh, in fact, under entry 300.15, uh, mind control, brainwashing, and destructive cults are all terms that are discussed under the heading of dissociative disorder NOS. Uh, if that's not good enough for you, uh, Stephen Hassan's book, Stephen Hassan, by the way, is the grand old man of cult mind control uh, counseling and intervention. Uh, his book, uh, Combating Cult Mind Control, was given uh, very favorable reviews by Lancet, by the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association, and by the American Journal of Psychiatry. Well, that's not good enough for you. Uh, Professor Philip Zimbardo, former president of the Western uh, Psychological Association, uh, teaches a class at Stanford University entitled The Psychology of Mind Control and has, in fact, written an excellent book with the same title. Uh, following Professor Zimbardo's lead, there are actually uh, quite a few uh, mental health care professionals who have specialized in the treatment and recovery of mind control victims uh, because the study of mind control is both fascinating and a largely neglected subject and because it's a growing problem. So if we're going to talk about mind control, I suppose we need a definition of it. Um, this is going to be Gantz's definition of mind control. Boy, howdy. Uh, actually, for our, this is just our operative definition for this uh, little presentation. Mind control is any technique or set of techniques used to create a dissociative disorder in the mind of a human subject. 
in which that subject's authentic personality is overlaid or suppressed uh, with a false or fabricated personality and or implanted with phobias for the purpose of making that subject compliant and obedient to a mind-controlling leader or group. Does anybody have any questions about that definition? Is everybody cool with that definition? Actually, that's, that's an old-fashioned term that is uh, no longer very much in use. Uh, what we used to think was a multiple personality disorder is really just uh, the authentic self uh, doing battle with uh, the artificial personality that was created for that individual and one emerges and one submerges every now and then. And that's another interesting point I'm going to cover here in a minute. Mind control is never 100% effective. Uh, it has to be uh, reinforced periodically. It has to be um, it, it has to be uh, an ongoing process because apparently the human spirit is a lot more resilient than we used to think it was and the authentic self, the baseline personality of the victim uh, is never actually destroyed and it will always try to, uh, try to reemerge and reassert itself. Now, there are two basic aims of mind control. Uh, number one, as I said, is the creation of an artificial personality. Number two is the creation of phobias. Why phobias? Uh, because phobias will keep the subject involved or obedient to the uh, mind controller or the group or the cult or whatever you want to call it. Uh, even after the victim no longer believes in the doctrines of the cult, or has any respect for the mind controller or whatever. What are the methods used uh, to achieve these two, uh, these two goals? Um, well, we have first of all hypnosis, the hypnotic induction. Uh, in fact, the so-called charisma of many uh, cult leaders really is just a matter of how good are they at, um, at uh, uh, bringing about a hypnotic induction. Uh, and there are many ways of doing that. Some are much more casual uh, and, and uh, easily uh, uh, created than you might think. Uh, then there is the ever popular behavior modification. Uh, that's just actually a fancy way of saying a system of rewards and punishments. Number three is PTSD post-traumatic shock syndrome, which is created by trauma. Uh, in plain language, that means torture uh, or any form of undue stress. And then number four, and that's my f personal favorite, drugs. <coughs> now, you'll notice, that, um, you'll notice that all four of these uh, methods, and there are countless varieties of these within each of those uh, discrete uh, sets of methods. Uh, there are countless varieties of drugs, hypnotic inductions, trauma, etc. But all of them uh, create an altered state of consciousness or they create uh, a remarkably different worldview. Uh, for example, a uh, hypnotic induction obviously creates an altered state of consciousness. It is an extremely relaxed state in which the victim becomes much more suggestible than usual. Uh, and a hypnotic induction is uh, more easy to, um, to instigate than you might imagine. For example, if I look at you and you return my gaze and I focus my eyes exactly three inches behind where your eyes are. In other words, I just focus my eyes on your skull. Oh, no, you broke contact now, but if I do that, that's an Ericksonian induction that will make you slightly more suggestible than usual. It will, give, it will put you in a slight trance state. Very slight, but it means that my words will have a greater impact than they would otherwise. There's also an Elman induction that just uses hand gestures. Faith healers use that a lot. I caught Benny Hinn doing that one time. I'm not kidding. Um, trauma, PTSD, post-traumatic stress 
disorder. Uh, the human mind is constructed in such a way that events, not only the events that occurred during uh, trauma, but also the events occurring immediately before and immediately after are remembered with extreme clarity. So obviously this uh, can be used uh, for conditioning and indoctrination very easily. A system of rewards and punishments. When you use a system of rewards and punishments on an individual from a position of control or authority, you regress that individual into a childlike state in which they become dependent on you and you become their mommy or their daddy. Fun, fun. Um, drugs, well, we all know that drugs create an altered state of consciousness, don't we? Now, um, <laughs> some of us know from more direct experience than others. <laughs> now, if I'm going to talk about, uh, well, that's your choice, uh, unless you're mind control. Uh, now, if I'm going to talk about the history of mind control per se, I would have to start with the old Stone Age because people have always wanted to control each other's uh, beliefs and behaviors in one way or another. But when I uh, discuss the modern history or, uh, of mind control, I really don't need, I need to go really no further back than the early years of this past century to 1919 or thereabouts and the work of B.F. Skinner father of uh, behavioral psychology and his behavioral modification. Skinner, incidentally, interestingly enough, was uh, an intelligence agent during World War II. Isn't that interesting? Um, what do you think he learned in the trenches? And uh, the infamous Skinner box was a crude uh, but effective uh, implement that he used. By the way, he put his daughter in one when she was uh, a little girl. She committed suicide in her 20s. Uh, you know, there might be an association there. Well, which daughter? There were two. The one that went into the box committed suicide. Now, anyway, the um, Dr. Donald Ewan Cameron uh, is the fellow we need to think about relative to the creative use of drugs and kind of a multimedia approach to mind control. And Cameron, in 1957, was given control of the, uh, the Allen Institute at McGill University, Montreal. Uh, he used an interesting recipe. Uh, drugs like Cyrenol and LSD, interestingly enough, was available at that point. Uh, electroshock and repeated suggestion. Now, uh, Ewan was kind of a, Ewan Cameron was kind of a bumbler and a sadist, and most of the people under his quote-unquote care actually just turned into vegetables. So his, uh, uh, his uh, regimen was more mind destruction than it was mind control. But there's a sufficient amount of evidence that he was operating with the approval and the financing of the newly created CIA, which was forged out of the old OSS uh, not long after World War II. And um, actually, approximately from 1950, the CIA began its MK Ultra program, uh, which was a project to explore uh, any and all possible methods of mind control. Uh, in fact, uh, there's the belief that uh, although MK Ultra, um, the MK Ultra project uh, was operative from approximately 1950 to sometime in the early 1970s. Uh, it was succeeded by several other uh, projects, uh, including the infamous Monarch project. Um, but there's a lot of evidence indicating that MK Ultra was behind the proliferation of LSD during the 60s, and that this was a really swell um, uh, experimental ground for them relative to the effects of drugs and their suggestibility. Far out, man. Um, now, when we really get, uh, yeah, for me anyway, but anyway, um, oh, well, I know. But uh, anyway, uh, when we get into the really high-tech end of, um, of mind control, that doesn't happen until we start talking about the work of Dr. Jose Delgado, 
What a guy. Uh, Dr. Jose Delgado of uh, Yale University uh, began experimenting with implanting electrodes and implanting wires in the brains of animals and humans. Uh, he called, well, these transdermal receivers or stimoceivers, as he called them. Now, Delgado's most interesting experiment from my way of thinking was the work he did on fighting bulls. Hmm. Okay. Oh, well. How mysterious can that be? Oh, well. Anyway, um, Delgado did experiments with fighting bulls in which he implanted uh, these so-called stimoceivers into the brains of the bulls and had big fun uh, making the bulls refuse to charge. Now, other neurologists had tried to, um, who tried to duplicate Delgado's work, uh, discovered that, and in fact, this is Delgado's most spectacular experiment. Uh, this fighting bull uh, is part of a breed that's deliberately bred to be aggressive. Um, Others, other neurologists and neuroscientists uh, trying, to, trying to duplicate Delgado's experiments found out that Delgado, even though he claimed uh, to be controlling the moods and uh, eliminating the aggressiveness of the bulls by his uh, radio waves that he was uh, pumping into the stimoceivers, the stimoceivers were really just little radio antenna. Uh, and... He claimed that uh, by, uh, by the means of these radio uh, signals, he could control the moods and the aggressiveness of the bulls. Um, other neurologists who just examined the film clips that he made uh, believed that he was doing no such thing, that what he was doing was actually scrambling the motor skills of the bull so that the bull could not charge even though it desperately wanted to kill the other person that was in the arena with it. So he was not controlling the moods. He was not lessening the aggressiveness of the animal. But uh, Delgado stuck by his guns and stuck by his electrodes and uh, kept experimenting with, um, with uh, uh, brain implants of all sorts and made the most amazing claims. Uh, he even went on, uh, on, on television talk shows back in the 1970s. So Delgado, back in the 70s, uh, a genuine mind control phenomenon, if not a very successful one. Now, the biggest problem with all of Delgado's approach was really brain mapping. His problem with mapping the brains of bulls was the problem that we all have with trying to figure out where... Well, that doesn't work either... Um, trying to figure out where the um, the given locations are. Um, Delgado ran into the same problem that everybody's running into with trying to map uh, any brain, human or animal, relative to emotions and memory and behavior. Um, Nevertheless, the experiments with implanting uh, electrodes and uh, even microchips in human brains went on. And by 1994, uh, a sober organization, a sober publication like the London Times, claimed that no, uh, an estimated 15,000 people worldwide uh, had been implanted with electronic brain devices. Now, those of us who are... Those of us who are um, anti-mind control activists find that uh, a sort of a conservative estimate. Um, brain control, by the way, was kind of in in the 1970s. This is a picture from an old magazine. Um, turned on, turned off was, <laughs> was the caption for that. Um, that's actually a fake. The individual in the picture is a model. 
and uh, he did not have any kind of brain implant uh, governing his emotions. But uh, the, the idea uh, that uh, Delgado's experiments were successful became kind of a popular urban myth, uh, even though he was uh, debunked by other uh, neuroscientists. Now, not all of the, um, uh, all of the implants were voluntary, <laughs> and we have numerous horror stories of secret brain, brain implant experimentation uh, that had become rather widespread. Now, not all of the brain and electronic interfaces are, are, um, are uh, negative. Uh, I guess everybody's seen the recent television sh uh, show, uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not, yeah, that aired 5 June 2004, uh, in which a team of French scientists uh, implanted uh, a, micro ch a computer chip in the abdomen of a patient uh, that was paralyzed, and it was connected with implants in his legs that enabled him to stand and walk with a walker um, uh, by means of computer control. Uh, nanotechnology has now gotten into the mix as well, and um, the, uh, uh, the experimentation that's being done now is really interesting uh, because uh, belief is now that uh, nanoscale carbon fibers uh, can improve this kind of medical uh, work in rebuilding neural pathways. Uh, biomedical engineer Thomas Webster of Purdue University developed um, a carbon nanofiber uh, reinforced plastic composite uh, to determine uh, whether it could improve neural and orthopedic prosthetics, but the first brain prosthetics have actually been developed. Cool. And uh, in this particular case, uh, there's a glass cone implant with uh, an electrode core implanted in the brain. The glass cone is coated with um, amniotic fluid uh, and the hope is that um, the, uh, the neural pathways will integrate this electrode uh, into the structure of the brain. The neurons actually grow, grow into, the, electron, into the, uh, the electrode in core-shaped implants. Very exciting, at least to me. Now... It's, it's, uh, it's actually more of an insulator, actually. <laughs> but uh, the, glass, the glass cone is meant uh, to be there so that the neurons will adhere to it and incorporate that electrode into the neural pathways of the brain so that unlike uh, Delgado's clunky old stimosievers, his little antenna that he's st stuck into the heads of bulls and humans, it will not be an invasive for an object, it will actually be uh, integrated into the structure of the brain and function uh, with the brain. Um, now, mapping the brain with regard to motor functions and sensual, sensual inputs of all sorts has been pretty successful. Um, here we have a rat. Um, that uh, has learned how to uh, control its environment slightly by means of the, uh, the microchips implanted in its brain. Um, rhesus monkeys have been, have been able to, uh, to control things. Uh, a paraplegic is, has been actually enabled to, um, to control a computer by thinking about uh, what he wants it to do next. Isn't that interesting? Maybe the day will come when we will all have a computer interface. We'll all be online all the time. We'll all be cyborgs. Isn't that exciting? Well, I'd rather not think about that, but anyway. Okay. But um, the, problem comes, the problem comes here when we try to map the brain with regard to uh, to 
certain types of more refined emotional responses, decision making, uh, beliefs, memories, and certain complex behaviors. That's a whole lot more problematic. Uh, in fact, uh, the mind controllers have never been able to map the cerebral cortex with regard to those things, and they may never be able to map the cerebral cortex according to, to uh, functions like that uh, and figure out where to stick the microchip. And one reason for that may be uh, the holographic theory of brain structure proposed by Dr. Carl Pybram. Um, how many are familiar with holographic technology? That's probably just about everybody in this room. So you know that um, any piece of holographic film can contain all of the information necessary to produce a holographic image. And the evidence shows that the brain uh, seems to function that way, that uh, the brain stores all of its information in every part of the brain. Um, that's good news for most of us. Uh, that means that no matter how drunk we get tonight, we won't wake up tomorrow having forgotten the third grade. It's bad news for the mind controllers because they don't know where to stick the microchip. <laughs> Now we move on to what I affectionately call the Star Wars approach to mind control. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Now, these two overlap, of course, because Delgado was always interested in... Um, Delgado was always interested in uh, controlling uh, these uh, subjects of his, human and animal, by means of radio waves. Gee, maybe that's what the old band Wall of Voodoo is thinking about with that swell song. You know? I'm on a Mexican radio. Now, microwaves have always also been uh, uh, getting into the mix, the use of microwave signals. But this is my personal favorite. How many are familiar with the HARP project? How many have heard? You've heard of HARP. Okay. HARP stands for High Frequency Active... Oh, sit down. Your Holiness. Uh, anyway, um, HARP stands for High Frequency Active Oral Research Program. Um, began in 1997 and supposedly didn't go completely online until 2002. HARP is actually a huge electromagnetic broadcasting facility in Gakona, Alaska, and the U.S. government claims that it is only a testing facility for ionospheric research. A 450-acre testing facility with 360 antenna. <clears throat> uh -huh. uh, critics uh, claim that among HARP's uh, various potentials, is a potential for defense relative to ICBMs, uh, also weather control, uh, but most importantly uh, from the standpoint of our little presentation here, mind control. Uh, heating the ionosphere with HARP's 360 high-frequency antennas that are all aimed straight up at the sky uh, can generate and transmit extremely low-frequency or ELF waves. And incidentally, uh, these ELF waves broadcast at the same frequency as human brain waves. In fact, people have even claimed that um, numbers, colored images have been um, broadcast, you might say, into their brains by means of ELF technology. Now, those reports are not substantiated, but they're darn interesting. I'm familiar with that, yeah. But most of us are standing here in the USA, so we're kind of more interested in what's going on in our own backyard. But that's true. The uh, the Soviets were also ahead of us in uh, espionage psychic research as well. Anyway, um, the um, all I can say about the high-tech approach to um, mind control is that it's high-tech, but low efficiency. 
um, as it seems that uh, all of these high-tech attempts at mind control uh, can disrupt uh, brain function, uh, they can interfere with cognitive abilities, etc. Uh, in fact, they seem to be able to create uh, epileptic seizure-like symptoms in some cases. Uh, they seem to be able to do anything and everything but actually fulfill the primary goals of mind control, which is to govern the beliefs, uh, the decision-making, and the behavior patterns of the victims. So, folks, we're a long way away uh, from the U.S. government being able to uh, beam elf frequencies all over all of us and make us all vote for George W. Yes. Um, so, it's back to the Stone Age. Um, uh, because these methods are ineffective, we're... Uh, basically left with the old standby methods of hypnosis, behavior modification, uh, PTSD, and drugs. And independent cults, uh, from that standpoint at least, are on a more or less level playing field with government agencies uh, as far as effective mind control techniques are concerned. Yes. Now, I, I'm not here to entertain you with bizarre conspiracy theories because, quite honestly, I'm more interested in um, mind control techniques themselves, how they're implemented, how they can be prevented, uh, how uh, the mind control subjects can be um, uh, rehabilitated, uh, different methods of intervention. Um, now, because mind control cults became a growing problem throughout the 1970s. When the 1980s rolled around, uh, people that were desperate to recover their family members, friends, loved ones, whatever, uh, came up with uh, a kind of desperate grasping at straws um, uh, technique called deprogramming. Now, there were a number of problems with deprogramming as an intervention method. Uh, number one, it's illegal because uh, deprogramming usually involved um, hitting somebody over the head, throwing them into the back of the van, and taking them somewhere where they could be isolated for three days and put through a brainwashing or counter-brainwashing program. Um, that's usually known as kidnapping, and it's frowned upon in all the best neighborhoods, not to mention that it's a felony. <clears throat> um, now... Also, deprogramming was traumatic for the victim. And there wasn't much to separate the mind controllers from the deprogrammers in that sense because uh, the, the deprogramming itself often produced uh, PTSD, post-traumatic <laughs> stress <laughs> problems. Uh, there were sometimes worse than the cult. Uh, people actually reported that some people reported that the deprogramming experience was worse than their cult conditioning was. <laughs> and so uh, when the 1990s uh, came along, exit counseling uh, became the method of choice to try to recover one's, one's friends, family members, loved ones, whatsoever. Um, exit counseling was somewhat unrealistic. It depended on the notion that the cult victim would voluntarily talk to a counselor, a psychiatrist, uh, a minister, a sociologist, whatever, uh, some sort of trained therapist, trained formally or informally. Um, both deprogramming and exit counseling were uh, content based and authority driven. That is to say that the, both the deprogrammer and the exit counselors were supposed to have all the answers. Come to us and we'll re-educate you. Okay? Um, it was authority driven in the sense that in both cases the primary interventionist, the counselor or therapist, was supposed to be uh, the director of the whole process. He was supposed to give orders over the whole scene. 
Uh, needless to say, exit counseling left a lot to be desired. Uh, then, as we enter this new millennium in this new century, uh, Stephen Hassan developed a method that he calls the strategic interaction approach. Uh, I like the strategic interaction approach because, first of all, it's realistic. It assumes that uh, the victim of a mind control cult will probably not be able to or willing to see uh, a trained therapist. It is process driven rather than content driven. Uh, it is more concerned with the process of uh, educating and recovering the, uh, the mind control uh, subject uh, more than it is uh, forcing the mind control subject to accept our point of view. It is team and community based, that is to say, um, the strategic interaction approach usually depends upon a team of people uh, to, uh, to really put it into motion properly. And it can be utilized by laymen, by family members, friends, by people that have no specific training. Uh, what I really like about the strategic interaction approach is that it's if it's done right and if it's done with sufficient patience because it's not going to usually take effect overnight uh, it's usually about 98 percent effective um, what I really like about it is that it builds bridges to the authentic self of the cult victim it bypasses the cult self by accessing pre-cult memories so it's not necessary to laboriously reverse engineer every step of conditioning and programming that the victim was subjected to. Is that a hint? <laughs> it's dark. All right. Anyway, um, the, um, the strategic interaction approach often depends on uh, sensory uh, stimuli. Uh, all factory stimuli are usually the most effective for accessing memories. And that's just the way the brain is constructed. Therefore, um, Hassan or some counselor using this might have uh, the cult victim's family send them a nice holiday gift package of Aunt Peggy's home-baked cookies. Uh, when the cult victim smells those, they're going to get a memory that predates their cult involvement, and they're going to access their authentic self, their baseline personality. Uh, the strategic interaction approach always bears in mind that uh, the cult victim is a dual-natured individual, uh, that they may be uh, perfectly normal and perfectly recognizable as the person you knew before until you get them off on the subject of the great Swami Fast Bhakananda and his teachings. And then you see Mr. Hyde come out or Ms. Hyde. Um, the SIA or strategic interaction approach also takes into account phobias that are implanted in cult victims. As I said earlier, the phobia uh, effect will keep the victim involved with the mind controllers long after everything else is gone. You'll hear old uh, cult members say things like, gee, I remember when the apocalypse was going to be in 1989. <laughs> but they stay in because they're afraid that if they leave, they will burn in hell or they'll be reincarnated as a cockroach 2,000 times or they'll be thrown into jail or they'll be raped and beaten. Um, considering the trauma processing of some cults, they could very well be raped and beaten. Um, so this is our uh, hope for the future, even in the face of some extremely sophisticated forms of cult conditioning. Um, something that I've not be, been able to substantiate yet for myself is the use of an extreme form of conditioning that uh, accesses um, some of the deeper layers of the subconscious mind and causes the victim's respiratory system to shut down 
if their cult beliefs are challenged. Um, supposedly, this is an espionage level technique that has been used by government agencies. Uh, this is the spontaneous cyanide pill. If an agent is captured, interrogated, or tortured, um, his cardiopulmonary system will just shut down and he'll die. Um, again, I haven't verified that for myself, but it makes a good urban legend and it may turn out to be true. Questions? You look like you're just... Oh. The, um, the, the last one that you were talking about, the strategic... The Whatever. strategic interaction approach. Yeah, is, is, the, is an offshoot of that what they now call interventions that they use for a lot of drug addicts or, or alcoholics when the family all gets together and they sort of, you know, put them in a room or him or her in the not, room. Not really. Um, that's, that's a kind of ham-handed SIA meets deprogramming sort of thing. Yes, it's great that everybody gets together and shows that they care, but they're just as likely to run the drug addict off in some opposite direction, you know, like, I'm not putting up with this, you know. Um, the strategic interaction approach is just what it says it is. It is strategic, it is subtle, and it is a gradual uh, process. Um, the... Uh, myth surrounding mind control are one of the biggest problems that interventionists run into. One of the favorite myths is, I'm too smart to be mind controlled. Only stupid people get mind controlled. I'm too intelligent. Okay, Bullwinkle, you just keep believing that. We'll forward your check to the Reverend Sun Myung Moon, you know. Um... Actually, cults deliberately recruit highly intelligent people. Uh, they recruit from college campuses and uh, honor rolls of upper-class high schools and stuff. Cults don't want to recruit losers. Government agencies don't want to recruit losers. They want to recruit people who are highly skilled and intelligent and real useful, and they'll use them till they use them up, then throw them away and go out and go out and get some more. Generally, but actually the real reason is that more intelligent people are uh, capable of uh, higher levels of concentration and it's easier for them to uh, be inducted into a hypnotic trance. Uh, more intelligent people are also um, slow to believe that this can be happening to them. I I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm serious. Questions? Um, regard. Uh, just you were talking about intelligence and how that's not a factor. How about uh, pig-headedness or stubbornness? Is that a factor? Uh, it is, but in the opposite way that you would think. <laughs> um, people that are stubborn and conservative about hanging on to their beliefs uh, may be a little more challenging to win over at first, but when they get stuck into a cult, uh, they're in quicksand. Uh, in the first place, their pride will not... in enable them to admit that they might have made a mistake. And that is, that's a unique challenge. That's the interventionist nightmare, you know. Um, so, you know, Winston Churchill on drugs, you know, you don't want that, you know. That's, that's bad. That's very bad. <laughs> and then um, also I, I couldn't help notice that you're not wearing a tinfoil hat tonight. Um, no. Can you tell us about the history and, psych and maybe some t 30 seconds of psychology on the people who... Okay, I am that. not, as you so, uh, so uh, observantly pointed out, a member of the uh, aluminum foil turban set. That's Johnny X, you know, he's the one that's into that sort of thing. But actually, he only does it as a fashion statement. He doesn't believe it either. Um, I don't do that because... Um, First of all, uh, I know what you're thinking. All these scars on my head are the result of, of knife fights, sword fights, street fighting. Uh, there are no brain implants in my head. My head. My head. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, no, but seriously, I really don't believe that all these harmonic um, 
technologies are really that effective. Uh, I, I haven't really seen them do squat except create a certain amount of disruption. Jim, uh, my question on the uh, the tinfoil hats is: Wouldn't having a tinfoil hat be a big antenna? <laughs> well, see, that was that was that was another thing that I've always secretly wondered, and you've actually articulated that. I appreciate you doing that. I would think that it would. I think you would need to, you know, to wear some kind of an insulator, you know, maybe a cork hat or something, a rubber hat, you know, whatever. And ground yourself out. Yeah, there you go. That's an approach. I like that. I like that. <laughs> However, we do have uh just to show that there is some uh hold on let's see this way. Just to show that there is some um where is it? Hold on. Ah, there it is. Just to show that there is some uh some substantiation. This is an X ray. Um uh, of a supposed brain implant. Uh, still in the skull of the subject, and theoretically microwaves, elf waves, whatever, you know, could be used to access that. Uh, again, uh, I'm reasonably confident that I don't have any brain implants that I don't know about. I don't, I'm not sure you can get that with an appendectomy, you know. And... <laughs> Yes, now that is a legitimate use for uh, for brain prosthesis, and that is in the works, as a matter of fact. Yes. Oh, I see. Sorry, it's just me again. Um, we, we, we both have mentioned Sung Young Moon a number of different times. Yes. Did they ever figure out exactly what his methodology was? Because he, he was probably the, the best known and had the largest group. Well, supposedly he may not be the, the most mind. skilled, but he's the one with the biggest, uh, biggest group, you know. Uh, his his recipe is is good. Um, they start out with something called love bombing, uh, where you tell the prospective subject, the victim, how wonderful they are, and how they, we just know you're going to be such a wonderful contribution to our group. And we've got to have you here. You know, you send a lot of pretty girls or cute guys after them or whatever, you know. And, um, of course, now, of course, now, ultimately, uh, any mind controller will actually destroy your self-image and undermine your self-confidence. And they've got to do that to make you dependent upon them. You cannot feel self-confident and independent enough to ever leave the cult. Um, anyway, following the love bombing stage uh, is the uh, the activity and social life stage. Well, we're having a meeting next week. We're having one tomorrow. We're having one an hour from now. Keep them busy. Um, one of the things that Moon's people have used most effectively actually is sleep deprivation. You get up early in the morning and you go, you know, to the meeting center or whatever and you sit around and pray and chant for half an hour and then uh, you listen to uh, one of Moon's uh, uh, sub-leaders or you watch a videotape of him speak or whatever and you're already in uh, a trance state from, you know, I mean, you're already goofy from a lack of sleep and from all the, uh, all the, repetitiveness, singing, chanting, praying stuff going on too. And so that is their method of creating a trance state to create suggestibility and to uh, further build and reinforce the, uh, the uh, uh, artificial cult self, the artificial cult personality. You see, um, people actually do leave cults independently occasionally. Uh, there is the exceptional individual that can break away without an intervention. Uh, it usually takes them a while uh, to work through the problems that they got from being involved with the cult, especially if they were, uh, they had a lot of PTSD type stuff used on them, you know, rape and physical abuse and that sort of thing. But um, the cult personality will disintegrate over time 
it just disintegrates a lot faster if you have the proper tools uh, to break it down effectively. Questions? Yes. Yeah, is it a valid theory that somebody who goes into like a cult or whatnot... And Can you speak up a little bit? Okay. Ah, okay. Is it a valid theory that somebody who ends up going into a cult, we'll just call it a cult, it may or may not be that, um, and then comes out, is it a the valid theory that, like, you know, uh, the, the victim becomes the, the, um, the aggregator uh, and, and, pr and continues the cycle onward? And well, actually that, actually, that does happen. Um, the mind-controlled victim uh, eventually becomes more trusted and gets a, uh, a lower-level position of authority and recruits more victims. And he's not consciously aware that he's mind controlling these people because some of these techniques are so easy to use. Trauma, for example, as a conditioning method is something that a lot of abusive husbands have discovered spontaneously and by accident. But it implants phobias, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and it, it, it initiates PTSD conditioning in the victim, okay? When I say cult, I don't necessarily mean some huge I organization like, uh, like the um, uh, Unification Church that we've been picking on all night. <laughs> uh, there can be, yes, uh, there can be a cult of personality that only consists of, of two or three people. Uh, destructive marriage can be a cult. Go ahead. That's the whole point I was trying to make. Okay, well, that's an excellent point. Yes. Um, Mind-controlled victims can create other mind-controlled victims, uh, and that's the way that's the way the Unification Church uh, uh, does its thing. Uh, it it has uh, a kind of a pyramid structure um, of people, you know, uh, and, a, and a definite pecking order, uh, and everyone uh, in uh, the Unification Church. Uh, below Moon himself have been pretty much conditioned in one way or another. I assure you. They grow up to be abusive parents, yes. And that's another interesting point I had almost forgotten to make, that uh, many cult leaders themselves have come out of destructive cults. And they, that was their education. They know how to do this stuff by rote. They can do it unconsciously. They can do it in their sleep. They can do it without realizing they're doing it. Um, companies, corporate entities, will often use a combination of reward and punishment, but also stress to control their employees. And sometimes there are out-and-out -out cults that have gained control of a company. And everybody is going to the educational seminar this weekend. Aren't you coming with us? Aren't you a team player? Do you see what I'm talking about? Okay. Other questions? Anyone? Uh, yeah, I've got a, I've got a question about uh, the implants you were talking about. Yes. Like, uh, I know they've done advancement with microcontrollers and regrowing people's eyesight. Yes. And uh, how complex are the implants you're talking about for the mind stuff? Because the slides you're showing are generally just antennas. Yes. And that, I've got a lot of old material that nobody's seen. You know, most of us have gotten on the Internet, and we know the scoop about the, the, the new, you know, uh, neuroelectronic uh, uh, developments that have been done. So I want to show you guys a lot of the old stuff that's kind of fun to look at, at least I think. But, yes, um, the stuff we're talking about now is extremely complex. Uh, compared to Delgado's old-fashioned wires that he was sticking in bull skulls. Um, what we're talking about now are very com is very complicated uh, microchip technology. And even, as I briefly touched on before, nanotechnology uh, that will eventually uh, mimic and duplicate neural pathways. Um, so, yes, we're talking about some very complicated... Uh, you know, electronic medical technology. Okay, and the only follow-up I had to that was, uh, do you think, the, do you see it reaching a point with the complexity of the of the advancing technologies mm. that they'll be able to do more than just destructive EMP, it, electromagnetic controls, which um, I recognize that's all they've been able to do up till now. Uh, doubtful. Uh, you're pushing me out into something that's actually beyond the scope of this presentation, which is the 
the eternal controversy between mind and brain. Where does brain leave off and mind take up? And I'll just drop you one little hint and say that I am not, as Lovecraft was, a, uh, um, a mechanistic materialist. I believe that the mind is not the product of the brain alone. I'll just put it that way. Uh, so my answer to that is doubtful. Very doubtful. Like I said, it's all a matter of mapping. And we can map um, uh, areas of the brain that govern motor responses and controls. We can map sensory areas of the brain. But we can't map uh, those areas of the brain that, get, that govern memory and behavior patterns and beliefs worth a damn, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> More questions, anybody? Yes? This gentleman over here. Uh, what's your view of a uh, subliminal suggestion as perhaps a method of mind control, either as a primary method or a supplemental reinforcement um, method? Yeah, because I haven't got my $5, so that was better than my webpage. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I would say that it's always a secondary method because it is not an aggressive uh, method that, that gets results quickly. That's why it's more usable to advertisers than it is to mind-controlling cults. Um, there are some things that advertisers would use, but they, they're not legally allowed to touch it. Uh, if I were given a free hand with an advertising campaign and I was Nabisco, I would convince everybody uh, to take up arms against Keebler and go and burn the factories of the oppressors. Okay? <laughs> Those elves are vile, incestuous foreigners. <laughs> Terrorists. And they have tentacles. In their pants. Anyway, no, go ahead. But uh, no, no, the, 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 the use of subliminals is a, um, is a, a second line uh, form of, of uh, seduction or coercion that will never take the place of operant, you know, aggressive mind control techniques. But yeah, that's a good question. That's a fair question. Questions? There's uh, somebody back there with their hand up who wants to speak. Um, how much of your research and your observations are firsthand? Oh, boy. <clears throat> uh, so you had to go there. Well, um, I thought I knew a lot about this crap as a result of working for more years than I care to think about as an assistant pastor in a mission church, most of whose congregation, quote unquote, consisted of drug addicts and alcoholics and transients. Okay. Um, then I wrote the Necronomicon files. And people actually, by some strange synchronicity, I would end up in contact with, or people would actually approach me who were um, members of what I call dabbler cults, just small groups that were uh, that the cult leader had centered around the Simon book, the Simon Necronomicon published by Avon, the cheap one that you can pick up for about six bucks. Yeah, and so I would say that about um, forty to fifty percent of my experience is firsthand. Okay. Um, I have also been in situations uh, in my own personal experience that I would consider mild or lightweight uh, mind control situations. Um, any more questions? No questions at all. Ah, there's one. Uh, I know this might be kind of off the deep end type sort of thing. But, uh, Let's dive talking. off. Let's go. Well, it's oddball, so you know me. Um, uh, but uh, you were talking about mapping the brain and all, all that fun stuff. Uh, yeah. I was just kind of curious if uh, you had seen anything where people got 
tripped up or what have you by folks with uh, learning disabilities in, in that respect? I have never heard of a specific situation of that sort, but um, I have heard this is a particularly interesting uh, case, thing that goes back into the beginnings of um, of uh, neurocerebral research, really. Um, there was a a medical man scientist named Pinfield who thought that he had figured out a way to uh, to physically access memories. Uh, but then he found out, or other scientists trying to duplicate his findings or his theories found out, uh, that it was something Pinfield could only do with, I believe it was epileptics, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but others, other people, the, the, the majority of people who have more or less um, normal brain function, uh, their memories uh, could not be local, they were not localized like that. Uh, it's possible. It's quite possible, in my opinion. Any more questions? Up, oh, there's another one over here. Huh? Are we done? Oh, we've got two, okay. Ladies first. Hello. What's up? I can't help but wonder, uh, with your expertise in this field, um, how many times a month would you say that you get laid? Ha! <laughs> <laughs> um, ha! Well, uh, not as often as you might imagine, because I refuse to become the thing that I hate, you see. In my... Um, uh, in my in my my um, most um, <laughs> idealistic delusions of grandeur, I like to think of myself as uh, as as a, as a freedom fighter on the uh, battleground for uh, uh, the human mind and and psychological and spiritual freedom. You see, so I don't generally use neuro linguistic programming drugs, hypnosis, and all that sort of thing on potential sexual partners. I can see you're disappointed. Okay. Look into my eyes. <laughs> Look into my eyes. <laughs> Children of the night. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, how does uh, mind control, uh, or how does a processing disorder relate to... Our I beg your pardon? How, does a, how would a processing disorder uh, uh, affect... Uh, the the application of a, of mind control like if if somebody was to try to pull some various technique of mind control on somebody with a processing disorder is it possible that they're that I don't know it could it skew the, uh, the the results of what they had anticipated of what the uh, the the attacker uh, wanted I don't know I can't really it, it might uh, I'll be I'll be honest with you and say I don't know and um, that ought to make me a little more trustworthy in, in, uh, in the eyes of those of you who know enough to distrust uh, so-called experts who say they, they know everything. <laughs> I'm not afraid to say I don't know. Okay. Why? It's too ambiguous of a question. I'm trying to find a better way to phrase it. Okay. Well, while you're thinking about that, is there anybody else with any more questions? Ah, one there. Uh, I'm sorry, I was out for a little bit of it. I might have missed this, but if you were, if you are so knowledgeable about the mind control, how come you haven't gotten into like the cult business yourself? Um, well, there are some moral ethical issues there. Uh, I remember one late night conversation with His Holiness, the Pope uh, Johnny X, and he said. John, if you need money, why don't you just start a cult, you know? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And, uh, you know, I started spouting dialogue from Luke Skywalker. It was horrible, you know. Just, you know I pulled a sword on him. It was, it was ugly, you know. But, no, I, no seriously, I, I, I really, honestly, don't want to become the thing I hate, you know. I, call me weird. I don't know. Yeah.
you think there are any positive societal roles for mind control? Uh, yes, there are a few. Uh, there are some constructive cults. Uh, I would, in fact, I would classify Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, with their little 12-step program, as what I would consider a constructive cult. So how do you how do you determine which cults are constructive and which are de destructive? Well, that old cult expert. Jesus of Nazareth gave us a really great clue to that. Uh, he said, by their works, ye shall know them. <laughs> you know, uh, do they do good shit or bad shit? You know, I mean, what are the results of people being involved with this group? You know, do their lives fly apart? Do, their, do they commit suicide? Do they lose all their money? You know, those are pretty good, you know, guidelines as far as I'm concerned, you know, you know. But, you know, the, again, using the AA as a model of a good cult, uh, they help people rebuild their lives. I haven't actually heard anything bad about Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's amazing because you <laughs> hear something bad about anything or anybody. Go ahead. Huh? <laughs> Drink up, Shriners. <laughs> There's a gentleman back there with a question there. Has it ever been documented anywhere uh, where the predator actually turned into the prey? For you have to speak to into the microphone. Has it ever been documented where the predator has actually turned into the prey where he tried to practice mind control on someone and he ac actually wound up having the roles reversed and he, was, he became the control? Not that I have ever uh, encountered or even uh, read about, but it would make a hell of a short story. <laughs> Next question. Anybody else? No more questions? Ha <laughs> ha, we're done. Let's party. <laughs> you actually enjoy this? Did you actually get something out of this? Was it worth attending? Yeehaw. Well, I want you to all bring $50 and put them up. On <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>